It's a great honor and privilege uh, for us to welcome Dr. Joshua Berman to BYU. Uh, he and I have enjoyed getting to know each other in several conference settings uh, where we have uh, been involved with programs dealing with biblical law. I admire his wise insights and his faithful convictions, and I'm very glad to have him here with us. Okay, so we've got to be closer to this. Okay. Joshua Berman uh, is a professor of Bible at Bar Alan University in Israel. He's also the, uh, so an associate fellow uh, of uh, the Shalem Center, a Jerusalem based research institute. I've mentioned already his book, The Temple, Its Symbolism and Meaning Then and Now, originally published in 1995, but has recently also has been uh, reprinted and is out uh, and available now. It, it explores the theme of the temple throughout the Bible. He also has published a book entitled Narrative Analogy in the Hebrew Bible, Battle Stories and Their Equivalent Non-Battle Narratives, published uh, 10 years ago by Brill, uh, which, uh, uh, eval which elucidates the uh, rhetorical conventions used in telling battle stories in the Bible. He also has published uh, in 2008 a book entitled Created Equal, How the Bible Broke with Ancient Political Thought. Uh, I recommend all of these books. The, the last one was a National Jewish Book Award finalist. He's also published widely in lots of uh, academic journals, the Journal of Biblical Literature, Vetus Testamentum, and Catholic Biblical Quarterly. He is an engaged scholar with deep interests across a wide spectrum of public audiences. He received his bachelor's degree in religion from Princeton University and a PhD in Bible from bar -Ilan University. By the way, bar -Ilan and BYU have had a number of close connections there in Israel. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Jeff Chadwick's archaeological uh, digs where he he has worked with people there from Bar Elan who have spoken frequently at the BYU Jerusalem Center. Uh, so we have good connections there. Uh, it's about time we have them here. Dr. Berman received his ordination as an Orthodox rabbi from the Israeli chief rabbinate. He and his wife have four children, three boys and a girl, uh, ranging from nine to 22 years of age, and they, uh, they live in a, uh, a, a town about halfway between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. So, although very different from our own experience in transforming the Provo Tabernacle to a temple, Dr. Berman's theme tonight will be from tabernacle to temple, but in a biblical sense. We look forward to being instructed and enlightened by Dr. Joshua Berman. Please join me in thanking and welcoming him to BYU. Thank you, Jack, for that really very gracious uh, welcome, and it's really because of Jack and not only uh, his prodding, but really his personal example and our deepening connection over the last several years that have made me extremely eager to come and visit with you for a couple of days. Before I get to my comments and these sources before you, I really have to say a few, a few words about what it means for me to come all this distance to be with you. When I look out at you, friends, I feel as if I am looking in a mirror. You see, when we look in a mirror, we see something that is, at, on the one hand, obviously very familiar. And yet at the same time, we look into the mirror to see perhaps what we might have missed, what might need a little bit of correction. And why do I say that looking out upon you and coming here to Pravo for two to three days is for me the process of looking in a mirror. You see, like you, 
I know that to serve the Almighty is never done as an individual. When we serve, we serve primarily as members of a faith community, a community that makes deep, deep demands of us and gives even greater rewards in return, a community that is at once geographically rooted in a certain place and yet also global in reach. And there aren't so many faithful around the world with whom I really share that. But I know that that's a central tenet here, as it is for me. But as I said, when we look in the mirror, we're also looking for what we might have missed about ourselves. And that's really why I wanted to come and learn, not just with you, but really from you. There's a Christian phrase that I, it really sings to me. We don't have anything like it in Jewish sources. And that is the challenge of being in the world, but not of it. That's a great phrase. I'm so glad that I learned that from my Christian friends. But it's so hard to pull off. It's so hard. It's so much easier to have a community that puts itself beside, behind a wall, cut off from the world, turn all the resources inward, let the, soar, let the spirit soar, and maybe that's all the Lord wants from us. But we know that our calling isn't that. We know that in order to do transformational work, you have to be in the world, and that means participating in it, conversant with it. But if we're too conversant with it, then, as Bertrand Russell said, when someone is too open-minded, their brains fall out. <laughs> but that's a very hard line to balance. How do we have the power, on the one hand, to go out and do transformational work, and yet not be of it? I struggle with this all the time. My community struggles with it all the time. And all of the members of the LDS Church that I know are such stellar examples of fine works, and deep faith, that I really wanted to come and live within it for just two or three days. And that's really why I made this very long trip here. And it just so happens that this struggle of how do we come to be in it but not of it, is really very central to my talk here tonight. I want to gain some insight into the tabernacle and the temple by dint of examining one particular name that the temple has in the Bible. You know, there are several names for the temple in the Bible. Uh, several more names in rabbinic literature. There's house of the Lord. There is literally the word mikdash, a holy place. Some places call it Beit Adonai, Beit Hashem, the house of God. All these different names. And you know, when an entity has a number of names, each of those names reflects something else, another element, another characteristic of that entity. Take, for example... Yours truly, I have several names. When I teach in a yeshiva setting, my students call me Rabbi Berman. And when I teach in an academic setting, my students call me Professor Berman. And my nine-year-old princess at home, she calls me Abale, kind of like daddy. My wife also has a name for me. And each of these names <laughs> reflect a different aspect of who I am. They're all true. And so it is with the temple. And the name that I'd like to focus on that we find in the Bible is a particular name that's particular to the book of Deuteronomy, where 26 times this book refers to the temple with a very specific name. Let's read the first source. This is the first mention of it. But when you go over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God gives to you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose, 
Hamakoma Sheivchar Hashem, to cause his name to dwell there. Lishaken Shemo Sham. Now, just what does that mean? I understand a place that the Lord will choose, easy enough. Doesn't say exactly where, but we get the idea. To cause his name to dwell there. Lishaken Shemo Sham. What does that mean? To cause his name to dwell there. The chisel G D or G O D. What what does it mean to cause his name to be established there or to dwell there? Well, to get a handle on what that might mean, I'd like to look. Sometimes we can get insight on something by looking at its polar opposite. And surely the polar opposite within the Hebrew Bible of the temple is the, I would say, anti-temple, the Tower of Babel. Let's have a look at the Tower of Babel and what they were trying to achieve there. The second source. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and bitumen had they for mortar. And they said, come, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. A name they wanted to make. The word name in Hebrew, Shem, means exactly, it has the same multiple valences that the word name has in English. There's name, my name is Joshua, Jack introduced me, we all have a name, but the word name also means reputation, as in a brand name, the family name, that's a good name. We're speaking about reputation. Proverbs says, tov shem, better a name, mi shemen tov, than goodly oils, with a play on word, shem and shemen. So that the word name we can really substitute with the word reputation. And so that maybe what Deuteronomy is saying as a first entree into that passage we read at the beginning is that God shall choose a place, a place that the Lord will choose to cause his name to dwell there. His reputation shall dwell there. Well, how does God do that? And when would God do that? What does it mean, a place that will cause his reputation to dwell there? I'd like to look at some sources in the book of Genesis that seem to be saying the same idea, that seem to be, I would say, early precursors to a temple, cultic sites that Abraham raises where we see exactly the same phrase. Let's have a look. The third source, Genesis 12, and we recall this is as Abraham is first arriving in the land of Canaan. And it says, and he removed from there unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched, pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called on or in the Hebrew is Vayikra Be Shem Hashem, that prepositional bet. It is not clear whether the proper translation into English would be to call in the name of the Lord or on the name of the Lord. And exegetes, ancient, rabbinic, and modern, have tried to parse out just what, it, what was Abraham doing here. Some say, many say, he prayed. What else could it mean to call on or in the name of the Lord? He was offering a prayer, perhaps a prayer of thanks for having been brought to the land that he was promised to inherit. But one medieval uh, exegete, Nachmanides, says, no, 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 the, that he called the name of the Lord doesn't mean he uttered God's name in prayer. Abraham wasn't looking up when he called the name of the Lord. Abraham was calling outwards when he called the name of the Lord because what he was doing was calling the reputation of the Lord. He declared before the inhabitants there God's reputation and his greatness. And as it says, he built there an altar. So we, what we see here is a kind of mini temple, a cultic site devoted to proclaiming the Almighty's reputation in the world. There are two other places 
in the book of Genesis where Abraham does this. It's easy to read through Genesis many times and not realize that Abraham does this gesture on three occasions. We've seen the first uh, in Genesis 12. Let's look at the following two, the ones in Genesis 13 and Genesis 21. And as we're reading these two sources, and we see Abraham doing this again and again, I want us to try to think, what do these, what are the circumstances that we have in these two sources, Genesis 13 and 21? What do the circumstances in these two sources share in common? Let's read Genesis 13. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, right, after the whole issue there in Egypt with his wife, and Lot with him. Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abraham called Beshem, on in Beshem, the name of the Lord. That's one place. Let's look at the next. This is at the end of his encounter with uh, uh, Avimelech, the, the king of the Philistines. Avimelech had come to him, had approached Abraham and said, I wish to make a treaty with you. I see that the Lord is with you. I don't ever want to be in tension with you because I know that the Lord is with you. So let's make a covenant. And the story ends as follows. Genesis 21. So they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, arose and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called Beshem Hashem, honor in the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Now, notice, friends, what these last two sources, what they have in common. You see, Abraham does not proclaim the greatness of the Lord every day when he gets up in the morning. You'd think he'd want to. I mean, that's what he's devoted to. Maybe that's what we're all devoted to. But Abraham does this specifically at two junctions that share one important thing in common. These are junctions in time where Abraham has come into contact with mighty foreign powers and has come out with his hand on top. In Genesis 13, he had gone down a pauper in famine, totally dependent on the powers that be there for sustenance. And he comes away a rich and wealthy man with Pharaoh quite humiliated. His hand comes out on top. And in chapter, thir in chapter 21, it was Abimelech who approached him and said, I recognize that the Almighty is with you, and therefore I always want to be on good terms with you. So that in both these circumstances, Abraham calls, proclaims the name, the reputation of the Lord, but only when he is at the top of his game. Now why is that? Why doesn't he do this all the time? In Jack's very generous uh, introduction, he didn't mention my, my childhood, and I want to say something from my childhood, or my young, youngest adult years. Uh, I grew up in the New York area, and uh, I went to school, to high school in Manhattan, and I had to take the subway, the Manhattan subway, every morning and every afternoon. And I will relate to you a story that happened more than once, a true story. The subway would be moving underground, and it's, uh, if any of you have ever had that experience, I wouldn't say necessarily pleasure, but experience it certainly is, you know, the din of the subway. You can't hear anything. And a figure would open the doors between the cars, a figure in a toga and dreadlocks, and he would bellow out to all of the passengers in the car, I've come to praise the name of the Lord, and all of the riders in the subway would like look down and you know, make sure that your, that the, 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 your wallet is, is secure. And nobody would take this person seriously. And this happened, I recall, on more than one occasion. Now, why is that? I'm sure that he was doing so in full earnest. And the answer is that sometimes, oftentimes, the message doesn't speak on its own. The words don't have power on their own. It's really all a function of who is giving the message. So 
when a figure in a toga and dreadlocks in the New York City subway walks in wanting to praise the name of the Lord, nobody's particularly impressed. But when Tim Tebow is leading his team, you know, into the playoffs, oh man, I mean, the, the pews fill up. And it's the same message, but when it's a message that comes from someone who has success, and he attributes his own fortune and success to the Almighty, people listen. That's what Abraham knew. If he went around all day, if he went around as they were taking Sarai, Sarah, away from him, kicking and screaming, and Abraham was saying, I'm praising the name of the Lord, and he's wonderful in his reputation, he is the most powerful in the world, that would be a bad joke. But it's therefore precisely when Abraham is succeeding against the most powerful kings, those are the times that he knows it's time to speak up and proclaim it isn't because of me or what I am. All of this success is because of the reputation, the name of the Almighty. And that's what these sources have in common. Now, friends, everything that we've covered here on this first page, these sources in Genesis, um, is really very neatly and nicely summarized at a rabbinic source at the bottom of the page. And I'd like to read this with you. I suspect it might be a, a first entree for many of you into rabbinic writings. You may have heard that there's a certain type of rabbinic exegesis called midrash. Let me explain what happens. In a lot of rabbinic writings on the narrative portions of the Bible, the rabbis do an extraordinary thing. They add to the story. They rewrite the story and add all sorts of details that you can go through right and left in the original text and you won't find those details. It almost sounds blasphemous. The, what's written is sacred. Nothing more can be added to it. And the rabbis add details right and left. They're not looking to supplant the original text. Rather, when they do this, what they're really up to is they use details that they add details that, in effect, throw a magnifying glass down onto little things in the text that you might have missed. And so they blow it all out of proportion so that now you won't miss the point. Let's see an example of this, okay, at the Midrash at the bottom. The Midrash at the bottom envisions the following thing which has no, no explicit basis in the text at all. When you add up all those years in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, it turns out that while the Tower of Babel was being erected, Abraham was 52 years old. It says nowhere that he was anywhere nearby, but when you do the math, he was 52 at the time. Well, the rabbis envision Abraham visiting the building site of the Tower of Babel, and this is what happens. Abraham said to them, what is all of this? He sees bricks, 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 bricks. They responded, so that he won't be able to do to us what he did to that earlier generation. You see, that generation, those people that built the Tower of Babel, saying, let us make a name, they thought they, what, what name do they want to make for themselves? That when anyone comes here forevermore, they'll say, wow, look at these pyramids. Look at the, who did this? They thought themselves high and mighty. They deliberately made their temple, their, their tower, out of bricks. Notice, not out of wood, not out of stone, but out of bricks. See, stone is made by God. Wood is also made by God. Bricks, every brick says, made by man. So Abraham says, what is all of this? And he says, well, we're trying to get higher than God so that there won't be another flood to get rid of us. Abraham replied, forget it. And then look at this. Abraham is able to quote the book of Proverbs, according to the rabbis. That's pretty good, <laughs> right? I mean... This is 500 years before Solomon, but with the rabbis, it's all, for a good, it's all good, okay? <laughs> Forget it. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. And it's clear that this Midrash is picking up about this, the use of the word name. The name, the reputation of the Lord is a fortified tower. And you all proclaim, let us make a name for ourselves. What did the Almighty do to them? He dispersed them. Look what this Midrash has accomplished. 
I'm sure many of us have read the book of Genesis many, many times. How many of us noticed that Abraham three times built an altar and called on or in the name of the Lord? And how many of us noticed that that, that, that phrase, likro b'shem Hashem, to call in the name of the Lord, bounces off the word name in the story of the Tower of Babel? I know I missed it. Well, it's good we have the rabbis to come along and add these elements to the story so that now we see, hey, there's a thread going through all of this. We move from the Tower of Babel, and when you open up your Bibles, you see that very quickly there's just, you know, begat, 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 and then we get to Abraham. It's almost as if the book of Genesis is saying we had this great ill at Babel. All they wanted to do was make a name for themselves. Well, we have to bring in Abraham who's going to make sure that we all get redirected and refocused to call in the name, the reputation of the Almighty. Now, this is all very nice about Genesis. What does this, have to, what does this tell us about the temple? Well, going back to my opening source, we saw there in verse 11 that the temple is referred to as a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. The temple will be a place where God's reputation can dwell. Well, the question is, what, under what circumstances would God's reputation rest there? How does that come about? I think that we can get a sense from what we saw in the name of Abraham. Surely Abraham, as we said, every day really wanted to proclaim the Almighty's greatness and sovereignty to those that were around, but he knew that he really should keep his mouth quiet until the opportunity arose to really get the impact. When he's scoring those touchdowns, or when Oral, Oral Hershiser set a modern-day record for consecutive innings pitched, and also praised the Lord and the pews filled up in the churches. Well, maybe it's the same thing also with the temple. Now, think about this. We all know that the, there's a difference between the tabernacle and the temple. And I suspect and you guys really know about this, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to an audience that has an interest in these chapters in the Bible. And I suspect that many present would say, well, that's quite obvious. The tabernacle was a tent, and the temple was a fixed structure of stone. That's true. But now let's think about when the temple was built. You know, we can well understand why the tabernacle had to be a tent. After all, the Israelites were traipsing around the desert for 40 years. So they needed a kind of, how should I put it, Ikea-style temple. <laughs> you know, well, I, I don't know, if you, took it, if you took apart your bookshelf 40, 40 times, you know, over four, okay, but you get the idea. It has to be something that collapses, right? So you, can't, you obviously can't go around the desert building temples at every stop. Okay, so it had to be a tent. But by that logic, the temple should have been built by Joshua, right? The entry to the land, they conquered the land, right? They certainly established some type of cultic center at Shechem, build the temple. And if not Joshua, maybe after him, one of the judges could have done it. Maybe Samuel should have done it. And of course, we all know that the temple didn't get built until Solomon. Why wasn't it built during all that time? And I think that the answer speaks right to the heart of all the sources that we've seen. If the real purpose, if the real designation of the temple is to be a symbol, a sight, that causes God's name, his reputation, to increase in the world, that will solely be a function of how successful Israel is as a nation. Well, let's think, what do we know? During the book of Joshua, there are some conquests, but at the end of the day, the map looks like Swiss cheese, right? You have some areas, when you read, the, they, didn't camp, they didn't conquer the whole land. That's not at all what it says in the book of Joshua. There are areas where there was major Israelite conquest, but enclaves of Canaanites. And there were other areas where there was major concentration of Canaanites, and small enclaves of Israelites. The book of Judges, a washout, totally, 
I mean, economic situation is bad, political situation is bad, military situation is bad, spiritual situation is bad. This is not an age, the book of Judges, that could possibly proclaim God's greatness to the entire world. Where it really all begins is under David. David had more success than anyone around him. In fact, I didn't bring it here, but those of you that have a Bible or remember the beginning of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, when David asks Nathan the prophet, can I build? Should I build? The opening verse of that chapter is, and it came to be when David had built his own palace and the Lord had granted him peace from around all of his, all of his, from all of his enemies. In fact, Look here carefully back at the first source, Deuteronomy 12. It already gives a, sig a signal, a sign, what sorts of things need to be in place before you build a temple, a place that shall cause God's name to dwell there. Look what it says. But when you go over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God gives you to inherit, you can't build right away. You have to dwell. You have to have a sense of being finished with wars, establishing communities, establishing a country. And when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety, and let me tell you, coming from the modern state of Israel, that's not something easily achieved. When you are so powerful that no one's messing with you anymore, then, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name, his reputation. Of course, because only when there's full peace will... Israel be able to say, hey, we achieved something. You want to know what its source is? It's the Almighty. And here's his temple, something that's to cause his reputation to radiate outwards. Everything that I've said now in theory fits fully with what we find in the book of Kings when Solomon builds the temple. Recall, friends, the earlier chapters of the first book of Kings. Solomon establishes quite a good working relationship with uh, Hiram, the king of Tyre. And Hiram, the king of Tyre in Lebanon, supplies Solomon with workers and with cedar and with goods and with know-how and with expertise. You know, we might have thought that the temple should be an Israelite affair, right? I mean, as, as, uh, as, as, as you, in your own practice, who, who, can, who can go inside the temple? Only members of the church in good standing. You would think that who could build Israel's temple? Only members of the community in good standing. What do we want imports for? What do we want Lebanese workers for? And the answer is it's just the opposite. By the very fact that Hiram is looking to connect with Solomon and looking to donate goods of high quality to the temple, that itself is proof that this is the right time. The world is looking with, with praise the world is looking with admiration at what Solomon has achieved. And therefore, this is the time for Solomon to build, as it says, in at least a dozen places. In the early, in the early chapters of Kings, I am building a house to the name of God, the Shem Hashem. And this is why when Solomon is finished building the temple, we find the long narrative that you have on the second side of your page, 1 Kings 10 the visit of the Queen of Sheba. I think that there is not another place in the entire Hebrew Bible where so much print space is devoted to a non-Jewish person who comes to visit Israel. We have to ask, why was this so important? Well, let's read. I'd like to read about her visit and use the ideas that I have been presenting here as a prism to understand what's going on here. What we are going to see is what did it mean for a very significant royal personage in the time of Solomon, what did it mean for her to come to Jerusalem? What did she see? Let's look, read these verses, and see what she saw. Now, when the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, right, his reputation, wow, this Solomon, he claims to have gotten everything or achieved everything that he has because of the greatness the sovereignty of the Almighty, she came to test him with difficult questions, presumably about governance. So she came to Jerusalem with a very large retinue with camels carrying spices and very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. 
Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was hidden from the king, which he did not explain to her. So the first thing that the queen of Sheba sees is his wisdom, his God-inspired wisdom. But that's not all. Verse 4, when the queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, and that might be the temple, but it also might be his own palace. Well, what does it mean she saw the house that he built? What does she see? She sees an economic powerhouse. She sees probably also technological achievement. Those of you that have visited Jerusalem, you see those massive slabs, right, at the, at the, at the wall. You think, how did they move? We, today, we, even today, we're not quite sure how they moved that. So those stones aren't from the time of Solomon, but presumably the temple or his palace were themselves uh, architectural achievements. The house he had built, verse 5, the food of his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his waiters and their attire, again, all attestations to the economic powerhouse that she was visiting. His cupbearers and his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told to me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. How blessed are your men. How blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel. Because, because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness. So let's add up the tally sheet. What is the Queen of Sheba impressed by? Or put differently, what are the achievements of Solomon's empire that make this precisely the right time to build an edifice that proclaims the sovereignty of the Almighty? It is economically secure, technologically advanced. It is endowed with wisdom, and she sees around her those last two words, justice and righteousness. So put differently, the temple is not a closed-door affair for Israel. We might have thought that it should be. Just the opposite. The temple is really a place designed to draw all the nations of the world in to come to recognize the sovereignty and greatness of God. This is explicit in Solomon's prayer in the next source, 1 Kings 8. In 1 Kings 8, at the dedication of the temple, Solomon goes through a litany, a series of situations when individuals will pray to the Almighty. And one after another, Solomon says, in this situation, when they pray to you toward your temple, answer them. When, it, when there's a drought and they pray to you from the temple, answer them. And when there's a, 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 a war and they pray to you from the temple, please answer them. All sorts of requests and needs for his people Israel. And then we discover the following, 1 Kings 8. He says, also concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country, for your name's sake... They come because they hear of your reputation, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he, the foreigner, the non-Israelite, comes and prays toward this house, here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. It's all here in just this little prayer. Finally, I'd like to talk really about, as the title of my talk suggests, the architecture. So now we can understand, I think, several things about the difference between the architecture of the tabernacle and the architecture of the temple. The tabernacle, indeed, was a tent. But it wasn't merely a tent because they were trekking through the desert for 40 years. It remained essentially a tent for those next 400 and so or so years after they entered the land. Why is that? Because it was a flimsy structure. That struck the structure of the sanctuary, right? Sanctuary could be tabernacle or it could be temple. The structure of the sanctuary, whether it takes the form of tent 
or whether it takes the form of permanent stone edifice, is itself a reflection on the vitality of the relationship between God and Israel. If you will, we can think of the relationship between God and Israel as a marriage. See, a marriage and a wedding are not the same thing. A wedding is a moment in time that begins the process of the marriage. But over time, the very fact that husband and wife are married doesn't really say anything about the state of the marriage. You can be married and have deep tension, God forbid. Or you can be married and the relationship can grow and it can blossom. Sinai, we might look at as the moment of wedding, of entering into covenant between God and Israel. But the very fact that there is a covenant between God and Israel does not mean that the bond is strong and thriving. So long as Israel is not living up to her covenantal responsibilities, that relationship is tense. And God effectively says, you will have a cultic site for me, but it's going to be in a wobbly tent. Because what's going on between us is kind of wobbly. And when we really get it together, and when our bond is really strong, then I'm ready to move in. I'm ready to call it a house. And that is in the time of Solomon. When Solomon creates an empire that itself is a vehicle to proclaim God's name, his reputation. I think, friends, we can see this with a very small but very significant detail that distinguishes the tabernacle from the temple. And that has to do with the position in each, respectively, of the cherubim, the kruvim, right? Those winged figures that are inside the holy of holies. I'd like to look at what the Bible says about the kruvim, Hebrew, in Exodus, in the tabernacle, and then what it says in the book of Kings. In Exodus 25, on your sheet, it says... The Kruvim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover of the Ark of the Lord with them. The Kruvim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. What you had is the Ark of the Lord, which wasn't nearly as big as this lectern, and the two Kruvim, each of them was a cubit and a half, about yay high, on the top of the cover of the Ark of the Lord. And what this verse is reporting to us is that the two Kruvim looked toward each other with their wings hovering toward each other. If you will, looking to embrace, but not yet embracing. By contrast, look what the Book of Kings says about the Kruvim. Here, there's no mention of Kruvim on top of the cover of the Ark of the Lord. No mention at all. But we have two other Kruvim that are mentioned here. And this is what it says. Chapter 6. For the inner sanctuary, he, Solomon, made a pair of Kruvim out of olive wood, each 10 cubits high, 15 feet high. The ones in the tabernacle were maybe 3 feet high. These are each 15 feet high. One wing of the first cherub was five cubits long, and the other wing, five cubits. Ten cubits from wingtip to wingtip. The second cherub also measured ten cubits, for the two keruvim were identical in size and shape. The height of each cherub was ten cubits. He placed the keruvim inside the innermost room of the temple with their wings spread out. The wing of one cherub touched one wall, while the wing of the other touched the other wall, and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. Their combined wingspan filled the entire width of the inner sanctum. So one cherub is like this, with his wing to the wall. The other cherub is over here with his wing to the wall. And in the middle, the wings now touch. And both cherubim are looking outwards eastwards, out. Why, do, why are the stance of the cherubim different in the tabernacle? In size, 
in orientation, in the tabernacle, they look at each other, but they don't touch. While in the temple, they're enormous. And their wings are spread out, and their gaze is together. Not at each other, but outward. The idea that I'm going to share with you is, I say this in the name for his reputation, of a great, great uh, sage of the Bible in the land of Israel, Rabbi Yoel Binun. And he says the following, and it builds, everything that I've said here is really his idea in the source. He says, Rabbi Binun says, in the tabernacle, God and Israel are at the beginning of their bond. Right? It's just after Sinai. And they get off to a rocky start. We have a saying in uh, uh, rabbinic Hebrew, all beginnings are difficult. It's usually said about the first year of marriage. Right? It's rocky. It takes time to get used to each other. It took time for Israel to get used to, you know, from Sinai, boom, into the golden cat. Not so simple. Rough, rough, rough and rocky times. So in the tabernacle, you have this pair representing God and Israel looking, looking, seeking to consummate, seeking to get it together, but not consummating. By the time we get to Solomon, and Israel is living up to her covenantal responsibilities, spiritually, of course, performing the commandments, of course, but also creating a culture that will be looked upon with admiration by all the nations around because it succeeds economically, because it possesses justice and righteousness, because they see in it wisdom. Then the cherubim are now all grown up. They're very big. And they don't need to focus their gaze on one another like a couple that's trying to work things out. Things are good. And so there's a very simple holding of hands. The wings meet in the middle and the couple can focus their energy outward to do the transformative work of looking out to the rest of the world and bringing God's name, his reputation, to full knowledge and full fruition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just say, and I'll, I'll take questions. You know, as I said, I, I, I think constantly about this question of being in the world, but not of it. And, you know, that was exactly the challenge in Solomon's generation. You know, we read all the rosy parts of the Book of Kings, and then it all falls apart. You know, how do you have openness to do transformational work in the world, be conversant, be part of it, and not let it, not let it sap your energy? not let it corrupt you. Solomon couldn't pull it off. I see wonderful models in you. And so as I say, I've, I've come really to, to not only to speak to you, to learn from you, and I hope in conversations now and after the talk and after the talks tomorrow as well. But now we have time uh, for any questions or comments that uh, the collected wisdom here might have about uh, what we did here this evening. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I don't know. No, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I guess you're referring to the visions of uh, the heavenly throne and Isaiah and things like that. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there. I really don't know. Um, um, but I, I think that it is fair to say this, the, the sources that we have here are the only ones that I'm aware of where it speaks of two, two cherubim. And it seems to be somehow, uh, this certainly this is how the rabbis understood it. These are a manifestation of a relationship between uh, G God and Israel, right? Yes, sir, yes. Uh-huh. Wow. Hmm. Well, obviously, you know, what I said about tent as opposed to a permanent, a permanent building, um, you know, as we know, the, 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 the description in 1 Kings uh, of the basic structure has a kind of a, a receiving hall. So, you know, it seems to be just in all ways about permanence, about a house in a way that the tabernacle 
isn't. This is the most, this to the rest of my knowledge in terms of the actual goings on inside the generic sanctuary, the various vessels that are there. This is the strongest contrast that we find between the two. Yes, sir. Well, Deuteronomy clearly doesn't uh, doesn't want to go along with that. Um, oh, sure. Um, um, the gentleman asked, is there any basis for having more than one temple at a time? Well, what I would say is this, is that, um, uh, as you may recall, immediately after the Ten Commandments in Exodus, God says, all the places that you shall mention my name, I shall come and I shall bless you. And we find, in fact, that, you know, there were many figures uh, Samuel, many others, who erected uh, all sorts of cultic type of, uh, 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 of, of, of sites, in addition, that were above and beyond the tabernacle in their day. And we know as well that individuals continued to offer their own private sacrifice well into the Book of, of Kings as well, much to the consternation of the author of the Book of Kings. Um, but it would seem as though, uh, uh, and we can understand why people did that, People want to feel like they have their own connection to their Lord. You know, it's much more, it feels much more spiritually uplifting for me that I can have my own little temple in my backyard than having to schlep all the way to uh, Jerusalem, you know, once or twice or three times a year. But clearly, what Deuteronomy sees as the idea of the temple is not just to serve God. That's good. But the purpose of the temple is to focus a lot of resources on creating a symbol that will proclaim his name. If everyone's doing their own thing at home, that all kind of gets dissipated. I think that's part of the idea of the centra centralization of, uh, of worship in the book of Deuteronomy. Yes? Good. That's an outstanding question. Um, I'll repeat it. Um, everything that I laid out here this evening fits very nicely for the historical trajectory from Sinai through Tabernacle through the construction of the first temple. But that's not the end of the story. right? We understand the events that led to the destruction of the first temple. But within the rubric that I've presented here this evening, how can we make sense of the building of the second temple? Because as we all know from our readings in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, when the second temple is built, things are far from perfect. No one is looking at Israel in admiration at those times. We don't even have sovereignty over the land. right? The Persians are in charge. There's all sorts of um, um, uh, military and political problems with other people who are inhabiting the land. There seem to be terrible economic conditions. There seems to be not a single one of the things that we read in uh, the visit of the Queen of Sheba that would lead us to think that anybody would say anything good about Israel with admiration. Like, wow, shh, how'd they do that? So I, I think that one way to think about it is this, and I think that this is a kind of, I think it fits with the general tenor of rabbinic uh, understanding about the Second Temple. Let me go back to my marriage paradigm. Before a couple gets married the first time, there is a period of dating and courtship. And even if a couple is feeling good about things, they will take their time to make sure that this is really right. And they'll ask themselves a thousand questions. I think so, but I'm not sure. I think, or this is great, and this is great, and this is great, but not this, or I'm not feeling this. Right? We get that a lot, too. Um, you, you put your potential partner through the ringer until you say, okay, I do. Okay, then a couple gets married. Sometimes there are problems. Now, obviously, once they've come down a little bit from that high that they had during courtship, they don't call it off right away. In fact, things have to be really, really lousy 
before you even have a separation. Sometimes there will be a separation. Not a divorce. A separation. And as we know, sometimes couples that separate actually decide to give it another try. Now, when they get together to give it another try, they are not at the same place that they were when originally they decided to say, I do. Right? That's the youth and all that excitement and all that. That's long gone. But there's a recognition that, no, there's something here that's worth trying to save. Let's give it another shot, even if the conditions don't seem ideal, or certainly not as ideal as they looked initially. This is a way of thinking about the second temple within biblical thought, I think, certainly within, within rabbinic and Jewish thought. That is, yes, this is far from perfect, what's going on in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. But it's God saying, okay, okay, I'll give you another chance. Here, let's put it together. Let's see if you can, if you can get it together. And then, four or five hundred years later, when that doesn't work, then there's a destruction that lasts until this very day. Which for me as a Jew, for us as Jews, leads to the question, so will the temple ever be rebuilt? And if so, under what conditions? Will it be, and in fact, I'll just tell you rabbinic opinion about this. There are different opinions. Some say it's going to be a whole miracle. It's just going to come down from the sky in fire. There's an opinion like that. There's another opinion that says, anytime you can do it, go do it. You can blow up the dome, go blow up the dome if you can get away with it. No, let me, let me, let me recast that. Um, <laughs> there was a, a significant 19th century halachic uh, decisor who said the time to build is whenever you're able to do it. Right? He didn't speak then about, don't, he didn't know about the dome. He was living in Poland. But his point was, you know, if somehow it's possible to do, then you, you don't have to wait for a sign. And then Maimonides says, no, it's going to be a process like what we discussed here, that Israel's going to come back to the land, that the Jewish people will be observant of the covenant, that they'll have success in many realms, et cetera, et cetera. And then it'll be possible to build. So I don't know which scenario it is. I don't know. That's, again, coming from a Jewish rabbinic perspective. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Excellent. Okay. As Jack said, um, I, I wrote a book 20 years ago called The Temple. It's symbolism and meaning then and well. And that book sells, nowhere does it sell as well as it does at the Temple Institute. I like the Temple Institute. <laughs> um, let me explain, though, something about the activities of the Temple Institute. Uh, if any of you have ever visited, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. It's in the old city of Jerusalem. And you can go, and what they have there, it's not just a museum about the temple. They have actually begun to refashion and recreate the vessels and vestments of the temple. Some of the vessels, some of the clothes to be worn by the priest, all according to Jewish law, so that everything will be ready when the time comes, Messiah, not Messiah, fireball, whatever it'll be, we'll be ready. You know what I say about that? I say the following. Imagine the following. A young man and woman are set up on a date. And let's say, for a change of pace, it actually works nicely and they have a good time. Most blind dates, at least the ones that I've tried to set up, have been disastrous. Um, so the couple decides to go out on a second date. And on the second date, the young man reaches into his pocket and he takes out a, a small jewelry box, you know, those types that kind of spring open, you know, like this. And he says to the girl, I, I got you something. And she looks, she sees it's a, it's a ring box. And she's like, she's like a little taken aback. What is that? And he says, well, go, go on. You know what it is. It's a ring box. She says, I know it's a ring box. And he says, go open it. And she pops it open and there's a diamond ring. And she says, what are you doing? And he says, well, I had such a good time on the first date. I had a really good sense as to where this is going, so I bought the ring already. <laughs> now, what's a girl to do? I mean, <laughs> you know, there's nothing more powerful and evocative of joy than to see the engagement ring on the finger of a newly engaged young girl. Because there is so much substance 
behind that symbol. But that's just, that's just the point. A symbol is only as potent as the substance behind it. So when a young guy goes out and buys a ring after the first date, that's just, you know, immature and therefore has no value. Now, I'm sure that my colleagues in the Temple Institute, beyond selling my book, when they make the vessels and the vestments of the high priest so that everything will be ready when it's time, let me tell you one thing for sure, okay? When it's time, there will be no difficulty raising money for that project. You can be sure. It will come <laughs> pouring in from all directions. And I suspect that if the Almighty has given us I speak now as a Jew. The Jewish people, the deck of cards that we have, on the one hand, wow, this is great. We're able to come back to the land of Israel, live in our land, even have sovereignty in our land, but we can't really go up to the Temple Mount. They won't let us. And you know, we certainly can't build a temple now. It's almost like a tease. It's almost like God saying, you know what? I'm not ready to build that house with you. This is how I look at it as a Jew. You have to do the hard work that they did before Solomon built. Solomon's temple wasn't built in a day. It wasn't even built in the 20 years that it says in the Book of Kings. It was built in 500 years that started from the day they entered the land of Israel. You have to build your country. You have to build your society. You have to make a type of culture that the world will look at and say, wow, that's great. Not just the startups that you guys have there, but this is a model country. That's a challenge for me. I think it's also a challenge for everybody here your missionary work is as successful as you are. Successful in all ways. When people come to know members of this church, as I have had the good fortune, you say, wow, there's something really powerful here. It isn't just the ideas that the people are saying. Look at the lives they lead. That's the work that needs to be done now. That's what it means for me as a Jew to build the temple. I have to build a state. I have to build a culture that's worthy of it that itself proclaims God's name, his sovereignty to the world. So I think the Temple Institute is great as an educational tool. You go there and you can, all these verses in Exodus suddenly come to life. In terms of being ready, everything will fall into place when the time comes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. I think, you know, this is one of the great mysteries um, of the, uh, uh, the historical books of, of that period. We know, we know that the, the, uh, the ark was taken and then brought back in the first book of Samuel. We never hear what happened to the tabernacle. It doesn't really say. We learn in Jeremiah that uh, Shiloh was sacked it seems to have just been destroyed at some point that for some reason the prophets don't even tell us exactly when or under what circumstances. But I, I don't think there's any remnant of, uh, of the tabernacle itself. They think that they found outside of Shiloh the frame, the stone frame. It was kind of like the outer perimeter of the uh, tabernacle, but not much word on that. No, there was a gentleman. Who, yes, yes. At what stage? Okay, so I, I, I think I would go back to what I said about the importance of symbol having substance behind it. Um, um, when Israel attributes its, its greatness, when it has greatness, to the Almighty, that's a wonderful thing. When the tributes become the end instead of just a result of the good works that the people are doing, the prophets are very clear. This is not what God had in mind. That's what I would say. Maybe that's, sometimes I think, maybe that's why he has denied us a temple to this day. Because it would be just too easy if we would say, oh, okay, I know now exactly what to do. Take a bullock, take a dove, and it will all, all be great. 
They don't have to be good. I just have to bring sacrifices. It would be too easy to fall into that. Yeah. I think. Yes. Uh huh. Oh my goodness. Right. W what's your name? Circa. Yeah. Wow, Circa. I think you're a prophetess because we were just discussing this very this very story over dinner before we came. So it was good. I had a chance to look it up to see if I. <laughs> All right, what Sirka is referring to is in um, uh, 2 Samuel 5 or 6, 6, um, it says that David uh, uh, founded his, his capital at Jerusalem after he unified uh, the two halves of Israel. And uh, now having a capital in Israel, he thought it only proper to honor the Lord by bringing the ark from its place of safekeeping in some suburb of a suburb of a suburb uh, in the Judean hills uh, up to Jerusalem. And that seems certainly like a very praiseworthy thing to do. And then what, what the Bible says is that as they were dancing before it on the way up to Jerusalem, it seems like what it seems to be saying is that uh, the cattle slipped and a fellow unbeknownst to us beforehand named Uzzah puts out his hand, presumably to do a good deed, to keep the ark from falling on the ground, and God doesn't like it, and zaps him, and he dies. So the question is really double. It's, poor Uzo, he was just trying to do a good deed. You know, in my synagogue, if I saw the Torah scroll falling towards the floor, I would die for it. And if I touched the parchment, which according to Jewish law I'm no, normally not supposed to do, but that saved the Torah scroll from falling on the floor. I think people in, this, in the synagogue would applaud that. I hope God would. So there's a question about Uzzah, but there's a larger question about if David was doing the right thing, why did this happen? The two seem to be somehow connected. In my humble opinion, what's going on there is as follows. When David establishes a capital in Jerusalem and says, hey, we should bring the ark here. Notice, who, who does that help? Who is that good for, bringing the ark to Jerusalem? Well, David says it's good for the Lord. It's only proper that the Lord should be in a capital city. But who else is it good for? It's good for David. It's good for David because, hey, look, the Lord is with me. All the people see this. All of my neighbors around me see this. And when you look at the language that the Bible uses, it sounds like a military expedition. He gathered like an army to do this. And I think if you're going to tamper with the ark, then there has to be full purity of heart. Sometimes there are actions that we do. We say we're doing them for pure and holy reasons. But sometimes we have what the Hasidic masters called res residue. residue. I'll give you an example. Someone, a Jew, decides to get up and go and live in the Holy Land, to make Aliyah, which is certainly a great and important commandment to fulfill. And they say, I'm doing this because I want to live closer to the presence of God. I want to be with his people. I want to be able to do all the commandments in their fullest way. But also... This person has a terrible relationship with her mother, and she goes. So there's a mix. I think a lot of our activity, a lot of the things that we do, are a mix of very pure and holy, and then residue, let's call it, all sorts of things on the side. And I think that might have been a problem with what David was doing. It looks good to honor the Lord, but maybe there was also something in it for David that wasn't so good. And when you read about what Uzzah did, the way in which the Bible says, you would have expected the Bible to say, and the oxen were walking, and they, tr they, they, they tripped, and the ark slipped, and Uzzah stuck out his hand. It doesn't say that. It says, and Uzzah stuck out his hand to save the ark. B, 
because the oxen slipped. It puts his action before the cause of it. And it makes me wonder, I wonder if we had a video of that. What would the oxen slipping look like? Would it be that they were tripping them all over the floor? Or would it be a kind of a, a slight misstep? Put differently, was Uzzah always just looking to touch the ark? But looking, but he, well, he, he can't touch the ark. But maybe with the slightest pretext to do so? Oh, I, I saw you tripped. I, I, I was doing it. I was doing it for the sake of God. Or was he maybe doing it for himself? In which case it matches up with David. I was doing this for the sake of the Lord? Or maybe only 99% so. That's my own reading of it. Could be. It's certainly an important thing for us to think about. We do a lot of good deeds. Everybody in this room does good deeds. And you know what? Sometimes those good deeds have residue. They're still good deeds. And they're still residue. Yeah. Oh, in the lights, I can't even see some of the hands there. Jack, why don't you call on somebody for me? I can't really see so well in this direction. Okay. Yes. So going back to Abraham and the Genesis 26, it's a very clear example. Uh-huh. Um, so you, you know that there's been Jews that have been threatened to strike down on the line. Yeah. Um, and, and you're thinking either Aaron or Abraham would have done yeah. it. Yeah. Now, although there's a possibility that that's a true instance of the line being struck down. So if you look to the honor of the people who are on the line, that is, that would have been all of God's people. Um. It can't, be, it can't be the first preposition that you said, Al, because that's a very physical, geographic term. It's ambiguous, which is why it's been given different, different directions by different people. One more question? Okay, one more. Go ahead. Yes. 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 Right. Right. So, right. He called the name of that place where Uzzah was struck down Peretz Uzzah. That means, oh, I don't know, the bursting into Uzzah. Uzzah got burst into. That's what it means, that word. And David was upset because he understood what happened here was not simply, David understood, if I'm doing something of national significance, of spiritual significance, and something goes wrong, then it's not just a reflection on Uzzah. It's a reflection on me. And that's why I think David was upset. He wasn't just upset that Uzzah had died. He was upset about that. But he was upset because, what, God, what did you want from me? Here I was doing what I thought was in your interest. And so how am I supposed to be able to move forward if, I don't have, if, you, you know, if you don't have my back? That's what he was really upset about. Okay? All right, friends, thank you so much for coming out tonight and sharing your thoughts with me. Okay.